Let's take a look at the method that you would use to create uh, player objects or game objects. I want to talk a little bit about the difference between a game object and a monster object. And monsters don't necessarily mean monsters. That could also mean uh, things like NPCs um, or even collectibles or things like that. But there's a, a sort of a distinct difference between monster objects and, and game objects. Um, game objects are objects that you can assume would be loaded throughout the entire game. And, uh, and I mean that graphically. So for instance, uh, your player is going to be a game object. Uh, you're like a power up, uh, you know, a mushroom in Super Mario Brothers is like a game object. Like that's always there no matter what screen you're on. Whereas monsters are going to change from screen to screen. Like you go to the next screen and it's a different set of monsters on that screen, but you still might find a mushroom there or you still might find a coin there or your player is still going to be there. So these are meant to, or, you know, effects like uh, when you die, there's like that little explosion. Um, that explosion would be one of these game objects. So that's sort of the difference between game objects and monsters. Um, game objects are the first uh, objects as far as their index. So player is, uh, don't worry about what these are called, by the way. Um, these are just suggestions. So uh, player, uh, object zero um, would be player right now. This is one, two, three, four, all the way to object 16. And monsters actually start at object uh, zero through 15, I'm sorry. And objects actually, and monster objects start at object 16. So if you wanted to uh, load up a monster manually, you could create monster number 16 and it would create the first monster in the group. If you wanted to create health pickup, and like I said, this isn't what this actually is. This doesn't mean anything. It's just a, a, a default label here. Um, you'd create zero, one, two, three, four. You'd create object number four. Uh, by default, when our game starts, it creates object zero uh, at the at the predefined at this position, um, and that's it deep in a in an initialization code. So basically, when the game goes from start screen uh, state to normal game state, it creates object zero at this position. Um, but right now, our object zero doesn't look like anything. Uh, we did load some graphics for game objects. This entire part of the tile set is used for game objects but we haven't actually made the player yet. So I wanna show you guys this interface. It's almost identical to the interface that you're gonna see from monsters. So, um, oops. So if I show you this, uh, how this works, um, you should be able to understand how the monsters work too, but I'll show you the differences uh, in the next video. So uh, first of all, you can decide the size of your player character, your game object, whatever it happens to be. And these use the monster palette. Now we looked at the tile of the, uh, like the tile set palettes earlier, the background palettes. Now we can look at how to edit the monster palettes. And with these, you actually edit them right here in the editor. And this is the, I think the only place that they're exposed. Um, but what you want to do is you want to name this. So player palette and rename. Uh, and that way you don't forget, because right now they all look the same. They all look exactly the same, right? Um, so I'll name it player pal, and I'll use sub palette zero for the player, and I'll make what looks good on him, um, something like this maybe, um, would look good on him. Now this wouldn't work very good for a platform game that I was using blue sky, but for uh, a game where I'm using green ground, that probably looks great. Um, so I've got a color, and so, we talked a little bit about palettes. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm sort of jumping around here. We talked a little bit about palettes, and we talked about um, we talked a little bit about how the picture processing. Um, let me open one that's actually. Let's see. We talked a little bit about. sound off we talked a little bit about the picture processing unit and we talked about how it's split into groups and we talked about how this is main tiles screen specific path tiles hud tiles here's our game objects right here here's our monster objects right here um, so here's your sub palettes right here so these sub palettes right now are being used for the player these this the second row right here so this one is your player Right. I'm using this one for the player. These two are what I'm using for game objects. These two are what I'm using for monsters uh, and, and other and NPCs or, you know, the other objects, the ones that are created with the monster editor. These two are what I'm seeing right here. 
So when I'm looking at these two now, um, in in the actual editor with the overworld, when I'm designing a screen, the screen is actually controlling what palettes I'm using, right? The, this is, if I change this to this, this is the palette it will be aligned. It doesn't matter what I created the asset with over here. Oops, the, it doesn't matter what I created the asset with over here. These were sort of a guide like, hey, you want to use the grassland palette for this to make it look like this. But really it's the screen that's determining what palette um, this screen is going to use when it compiles. Very similarly, uh, if I look at uh, this game here, um, and I look at the tile set, these two are being determined by what is in specifically the player object. So this is what's going to um, be right here, and this is what's going to be right here always. So no matter what I set these other uh, game objects to, it's going to read what's in this player, uh, this this uh, zero game object to know which two sub palettes it should load into this first spot. So one good practice is to create a, uh, a player player palette and a game object palette. And by default, and then and update the colors to what you want them to be. And a good sort of rule of thumb for right now in the way that things operate is that this is going to control things like your, you know, your uh, projectiles, or if there's power ups on the screen, this is this is the one. It's it's going to be one of these two. But this is meant for your player. This is meant for all the other things that might be on the screen, um, that are game object related. And and so you know, I don't know what colors you want these, but I'm just going to make the, it distinct that this is different right now. And let's see, something like that. Okay, so I want to use this to create a player. So now uh, to create the player, I would go through and I could create animations. So uh, the first thing about this interface is I can go to manage animations and I can create a bunch of animations. For instance, I can make one called stand down and rename it. And then I could also add one for stand up. And I could add one for stand left. Oops, stand left and add one for stand down. Oh, I already have stand down, I'm sorry, so I can't name it that. It's not gonna let me, I need stand right. There we go. Um, and you know, I could add one for walk down. I'm not gonna go through and, and do all of them, but you get the idea, I can make a bunch of animations. And now that I've created the animations, I can, pick which one I'm actually looking at. So stand down, I want them just to be standing down. And I can pick the tile that I want, and I could actually affect the tile. I could flip it vertically, I could flip it horizontally, I could flip it horizontally and vertically. So um, you can't do this with background tiles, but you can do it with sprite tiles. So this is gonna export all of the, the flip data, the color data, the tile data for a frame of animation for this character. Um, when it compiles and if I wanted to create for instance a walking down animation I would give it a frame count from 0 to 8 so for this guy I'll just make give it two frames and I'm going to make frame 1 look like this and another option that I can do is I can copy a frame and I could paste that frame the entire frame and I can also flip that frame so now I can look at the animation it's going to kind of walk back and forth like this. Um, so that's basically how to set up animations. Uh, now I'm going to go into object details. Um, so every object needs that needs some details set. Um, I have two different types of animation. I have walking and I have standing. So I need to set up two different animation types. I have a bunch of animations, but they're directions for two different animations, idle or standing and, and walking. So I'm going to rename one to stand. And I'm gonna rename and I'm gonna add one for walk. And for stand, I want to select the direction uh, that he'll be standing based on the direction he might be facing. The game will see him facing. So stand down, stand right, stand right 
stand right. May, maybe this would be up. Maybe this would be down. It really depends on your preference. This would definitely be stand up. This would be left, left, left. And really it depends. Did you make a diagonal animation? If not, did you make an animation or did you make a, uh, uh, do you like it better if he's facing down when he's moving diagonally um, or not? And if you don't use an animation, like let's say you make a platform game and you only have left and right, there is no up or down or diagonals. That's okay. I would still suggest setting all these to a value, um, but but it's okay if you're not going to use them all. It's still going to export the, the bytes even if you don't use it, but your code will just never get to the point where it's showing that direction. And that's okay. Um, for walk, I would now need to go to walk down, and I would set these to walk right, walk right, walk right, walk up, walk up, walk left, walk down. Um, I didn't create those, but that's how I would set that up. Okay, so that's how I um, can create different types of animations. Um, I could actually create the animations. I could create two different animation types. Uh, and I'm going to show you, before I go to details, I'm going to show you where I would use that. So inside actions, you have different actions that this player can take. Now, some of these modules are going to have things set up by default. So for instance, in the platform engine, the uh, zero is when he's standing still, one is when he's walking, two is when he's jumping, and three is when I think he wins the game. I think that's how this is set up. So what I would do is I would go to zero and make sure it's on stand. One is walk and he does have a little bit of an animation so I would give him an animation speed we don't worry about a lot of this stuff too much for a player but we do worry about it a lot in monster so we're going to take a look at that when we get to monster um, we do want to give him a bounding box and for a platform game I like to give it one pixel because the gravity pulls him down by one pixel um, for and if, if you notice that he's stuck in the ground on a platform game, you might want to check and see if you've left that one pixel. Um, if if it's a if it's a top down game, you know I like to a lot of times I like to just use that. So that way, if he walks against a rock, it kind of looks like he's a little bit in front of it, like Legend of Zelda. Um, but that's up to you. You can set the bounding box and play around with that. Lastly, we have details. So in our details. This is going to be the place where it determines how much health we have at the beginning of the game. So I can give him five health, and that's what's going to show up uh, in my HUD if I set health. Um, I also need to make sure that this is a player type of object. So when I'm setting up an object, I need to determine what type of object it is. He is this is a player. Not only is it a player, your player object, and only the player object for right now, uh, is persistent. What persistent means is when you go from one screen to the next screen, uh, it erases all of the object data and loads the new object data unless persistent is checked. And for a player, we want the player to remain. When I, I don't want to erase him and then recreate him because then he's going to get all his health back. He's going to get his experience is going to go back to zero, et cetera, et cetera. I don't want that. I want the same object to stay there, to stay in place. So I want him to be persistent. And right now, he's the only object that you want to persist over screen boundaries. Um, if it was a monster, I would... I would not click either of these and I click monster if it was a monster weapon like a fireball I would click monster weapon if it was a player fireball or melee weapon I would click player weapon uh, if it was a pickup uh, power up if it was a target um, whatever and honestly if you do none of these it should ignore all the collisions uh, if it is still observing a collision if you click on observe, uh, ignore all collisions it definitely should ignore all the collisions uh, lastly with the with the player I need to give him <clears throat> a speed and an acceleration speed. And I would keep the speed sort of capped in this first half, especially for players. You can experiment with this, but uh, usually I've found that, you know, around 40 to 50 is a pretty good speed for a player. And acceleration speed, do you want him to feel like he's got inertia, like you have to hold the button for a minute for him to, to start moving, or, or do you want him to just like launch straight away like in an RPG? Um, so that's what acceleration speed is. Jump speed is unobserved right now that we handle it in a different way. We may reinstitute this meter, um, but for right now, this, this is ignored. So really, you're just worrying about normal max speed and acceleration speed. So that's basically how to set up your, the, the main part of your player. Uh, and as you start playing around with this and check out some of the other tutorials, you'll get some ideas on other things that you can do with the player object and how it actually works with some of these other uh, game objects uh, in order to sort of create the full player object effect. Lastly, if you hit save, all that stuff is saving automatically when it comes to game objects. But you can see it still looks like the four little heads over here. If I hit save, 
now it'll actually look like my player in the window. That's all. Everything else is saved automatically. So that's how I set up a player game object.